feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. But it's a- hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Shrimp Tank. I'm your co-host, Ted Jenkin, here with my co-host, Lee Heisman, where every single week we bring you some of the brightest and best CEOs and entrepreneurs and business owners in and around the United States. This is the combination right here, the intersection of street smarts and book smarts. That's where it all happens for our entrepreneurs. We know that if you're an entrepreneur, you want to sometimes learn how to start a business, sometimes how to scale it, and maybe one day exit stage left. That's the dream, Lee. Some people want to be able to exit the business and make a lot of money. Some people want to keep it for their kids and keep that business in the family for the rest of their lives. Uh, today, uh, we're joined by a, a serial entrepreneur. Uh, Jacob Mead. He's the CEO of the Mobile Spot. He's also a consultant. He's a business coach. And uh, I will say, Lee, you said this in the beginning, he might have one of the single best one page, what we call press kits. We get these sometimes on the show on here. What was your comment about the press kit? What did you say? So myself and Jacob, a compliment to you. I'm highly critical. I I keep my comments to myself, Jacob, if it's bad, let's say that, but it's actually (laughs) quite good. And I will tell you, and you know this, Ted, it's never what somebody says or it's never what the words say. It's how it, makes, it's how it makes you feel. And when I looked at Jacob's one pager, not only is the photograph spectacular because it's a different look, it's a different position that he's in compared to anybody else, but the words and the subtle font changes and highlights, you know, as I was complimenting Jacob, Ted, he said, Lee, I'm actually updating it. So Jacob, I'm expecting a copy of that when you get it. <laughs> and, and if you're a listener right now, you do want, and we're going to go out at the end of this to let you know how you can find Jacob. And you can see the same thing I'm looking at, plus his Instagram page and all of his social media. Yeah, so I'm so curious just to start this thing because you are doing multiple businesses, but you literally took a business from $0, which is where all businesses start. And as our good friend, Fran Tarkenton says in here, if you don't have sales, you don't have a business. And you got sales to a million dollars in a short period of time. How did you scale revenue so quickly when you started your business? Man, it, you know, I have to go back in time for this because I was actually 21 years of age when I started my <laughs> business. So um, 31 now, but um, so let's let's talk about that for a second. So I had this dream of opening up this business for a long time and I never really went forth with it until I said, you know what? I can't do this corporate stuff anymore. I, I, I've been excelling at it for too long. I'm making other people money. It's time for me to go out on my own. And I always had that drive to help people too. And I was kind of limited in that corporate world of, of who I could help and the target audience of who I could help. So that really made my decision of, hey, let's go and uh, create this business. So when I first started, um, I had no money. I mean, I was poor. I, I went $50,000 in debt, which isn't too much to start a business, but I went $50,000 in debt, most of it on credit cards. No idea, no plan of how I'm going to pay this off. But I knew one thing was important. I knew cash flow is the biggest killer of businesses. So I, I said, hey, I, as soon as I start this business, I need to get this many sales in for the first month. And I just set my goal and I went for it. And I was actually able to achieve that goal for the first month. And so I doubled it for month two. And then again, for month three, well, then we stalled out. I was like, well, what am I doing wrong? Like we're stalled out. I don't know how we're, how we're not getting more customers then. And the biggest mistake is I, I wasn't advertising. I was just doing all word of mouth and doing such a great job for my current customers that everything's just word of mouth and it stalled me out. And so I looked into a huge marketing team, took the risk and said, hey, I'm going to invest in this marketing team. I'm going to figure out how to get this done. Did that. And as soon as I invested in that marketing team, we started doing more marketing efforts. We've seen a huge increase in our customer base. So I'm out hiring employees, training them, teaching them, all while taking on this bigger customer base. And so at that point, now now we're, we're, we're cash, we have a significant amount of cash flow. So we're doing great. And then the next step came to be, okay, well, how can I get this to run on its own? You know, and, and Jacob, that's actually, you took the words right out of my mouth because that was my next question, which was you've had your business running. I hate to say the word autopilot, but it's been running on its own. You know, you've been, you were running the business. You're not running in the business, of course. And you've been doing that for two years. And, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, people that want to be entrepreneurs, or even entry-level entrepreneurs might think they're failing because they're working 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week to start their business. There's no way, Jacob, as we know your, your business has become more automated and it's running on its own and you're able to operate it, not run in it. But please talk to those entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs that say, how did you get there? Did it just start day one and suddenly it's on its own? Or how much misery and time did you put in 
to get to this point. And, and also part two of that is how long does it take to suffer and put the misery in before you start seeing that you're going to turn the corner? Oh, wow. Those are such great questions. And I'll tell you when it all changed for me. I was that person that was putting 12 hour days in every single day. I was grinding, 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 and I, I did it constantly. It all really changed for me when my wife was having her first baby and we were, we were in the hospital and she just gave birth. And I, I looked at my beautiful baby girl and I was like, you know, something has to change. I, I can't do 12 hour days anymore because I'm going to miss out on so much time. Like I, I want to make sure I spend as much time with her as possible. And I can remember that feeling because it was a gut wrenching feeling of how am I going to do this? Am I going to lose everything because I'm not going to work 12 hour days? Like what is the process here? Like, what do I do? So I went back into my store and I sat down and I started doing the grinding process again. And I had to stop myself, re re reground myself and say, listen, figure this out or you're going to miss out on all those special moments. And it was at that time I, I figured it out. I actually went and I, I figured, okay, well, the first thing I need to do is I need to take inventory of everything I'm doing and I need to make sure that it's documented. So that way that people aren't constantly coming to me for phone calls. Cause the last thing I want to do is step outside my business. And I'm constantly getting all these phones, text messages of how to put out this fire or that. So I took inventory and, and I made a list of everything I was doing. And it was a long list and I wrote it down physically on paper. And then I came up with solutions to each individual thing that I was doing. Some of that consisted of hiring more people. Some of that consisted of adding in some systems and automations. Some of that consisted of documentation, but I made that list. And then I made it a priority over the next 30 to 60 days to implement all of that. So I, I, I did that and it sounds easy now that I go back and look at it, but it wasn't at the time because you have everything that's pulling you left and right. And you, you want to almost like, stick with it because you feel like you have to always be in your business. And so I, I finally got to the point where I stepped away. It was one week straight. I didn't go in for a whole week. That ran really smooth. And then I stepped up to two weeks, hold 30 days. And then by the time the 60 days rolled, rolled around, I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it right. I'm going to do it for two years and I'm going to make it happen. And uh, hardest thing I ever did. I mean, it was the toughest thing I ever did was step away for two years because believe it or not, you actually have a huge feeling of guilt and it comes at you in a huge wave, like this gigantic wave of guilt just hits you and it like almost pushes you back. It's the guilt of I'm not doing anything or I'm not with my team. I'm not working side by side. I'm not doing enough. All of these feelings like just hit you and it starts filling your, your, your brain and overcoming that was the biggest hurdle. Like that was the hardest thing for me to overcome. You know, Jacob, all, all, you know, think about the world of, of your week, you know, everyone, I always said the one equalizer we have in life, no matter race, religion, gender is we all have 168 hours in a week. And, and uh, really, you know, you've come up with this concept of, I want to hear more about this, about how do you purchase time? And I, I'd love to hear that because I've always felt like, yeah, there's a million different reasons people may not be able to make it as an entrepreneur, but the one thing nobody can deny, and we may have different responsibilities, but we all get the same hours of in every single week. What do you mean by purchasing time? And this is actually a really fun concept for me because a lot of times people are doing things and doing tasks that they shouldn't be doing. But the only reason why they're doing those tasks is for a couple reasons. I find that a lot of people don't know how to relinquish control. They oh. feel as if they do it the best, they're going to do it, and they have no way to be able to relinquish the control to somebody else. Um, I've told a lot of people this, hey, if someone can do your job 80% as well, it's time to give up that task and let them do it 80% as good as you can so that we open up more time. So right there is one step where you just bought more time by just relinquishing control. But then the, number, uh, then the other thing is just say no. So say no to things that, aren't important or that don't align with your priorities. I am guilty of this. I love to help people. So I say yes a lot. Um, I've been known as a yes man. Like, yeah, Jacob will do this for you. But I had to say no. And it was the toughest thing for me to start doing because I thought people were going to look at me differently. And they might have. But, you know, I started to align my priorities with my time of what was important for me, what was important for my family, what was important for my company to be able to grow and for my team to feel like that they have a great leader. And once I started to do those two things and I, I relinquished control to my team and I was saying no to things that didn't align with my priorities, 
that's when I was able to figure out, hey, this is purchasing time back. And it, it is, in fact, actually purchasing time because when you're giving that control to your employees and you start to write out that list of everything that you're doing and you're hiring people to replace you, you're paying someone else to do stuff that you would do. So in the, t- in the sense of things, you're buying back your time to be able to do what matters most to you. And some people, that's building another business. To others, it might be spending more time with family, loved ones. It's whatever you want to do because you've actually got to that place to be able to purchase your time back. So Jacob, I, I know, um, you know, you mentioned your age, right? 31, I think, if that's, is that correct? Yep, 31. At, at such a young age, you seem so well-versed, right? You've been through some ups and downs and you, you're, the, the path is much more clear. But I always find this intriguing, you know, as a lot of our listeners and, and entrepreneurs out there listen to how well you have it together today. Can you tell me kind of one of your biggest mistakes where you've had a paradigm shift? Because you sound spectacular. I was complimenting your one pager. I see all of your media. But there's no way this came perfectly, and and it looks. And here's the problem with successful entrepreneurs: you make it look easy. But I need you to humanize yourself, and I need you to share some of the hiccups where maybe you didn't see something coming, or you made possibly even a catastrophic mistake. And we will we'll get into the dead rats comment later. So I, I saw that on there. I <laughs> That's a fun one for me. So yeah, um, maybe that ties into a mistake you made. But if you, if you don't mind, share share a little bit of what you've learned from your mistakes. Man, I have so many mistakes. And and yeah, I get that comment sometimes. Well, you make it look so easy. And it, I, I may make it look easy, but trust me, it is not easy. It is it is the toughest thing you can possibly do. Um, let's see. I would say one of the biggest mistakes, and, and this kind of really hit me, is when I was in my business and I was working every single day, I uh, built up a sense of pride and I built up a sense of ego. And it was a like, I can do it. I, I'm the best. I can do this. I'm going to be the best. My business is going to be the best. We're going to be better than anyone else. And someone, some listeners out there might be thinking, well, why is that a mistake? Like, shouldn't you want to be the best? Yes, but I was going about it the wrong way. I was sacrificing my personal like views. I was, I was sacrificing a lot of things that meant the most to me in order to get to that point. And I was simply saying, like, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll come back to that. And I was putting things aside that I should never have put aside in order to get to where I wanted. And once I recognized that, and I have a this thing, once I recognize something, like I will pull myself out far from that self-destruction as possible. So that's something I love is when I recognize a self-destructive um, trait, I'll be like, no, I need to get out of this. So once I recognize that, I said, enough's mm-hmm. enough. No matter what, you're going to stick to your values and you're going to make it work. And so. I actually formed some company values and some core values at that point in my stage of my business. Well, other business owners around me was like, why do you need this? You don't have very many employees. And they're laughing. I'm like, well, it's so when we do get employees or when we do start to uh, build our team, like they, they can come in, they know our core values and what we stand for. And so that was my biggest, that was as far as like almost like going bankrupt, things like that, that can come later. I mean, we were always in the red when we first got started and that was a big financial struggle, right? I'm not going to sit here and tell people when you're starting a business that you're going to strike it rich right away because chances are you're going to be poor for years. I mean, like you're, you're not going to have the money. And yeah, that was, that was a huge struggle too. But the big thing was definitely making sure I found my core values. You know, one of the things that that Lee and I have always believed in in building our own businesses and and selling them and, and building more is this term of we call it connecting without expecting, you know, uh, making connections, giving to people and really not expecting anything in return. And I wonder, you know, as a young entrepreneur, you've grown businesses and now multiple businesses. How how do, would you coach somebody today about how to build a massive network because I am a believer that you know your network is your net worth you know to a degree how, how do you look at that and and how do you build it no matter where you are big city small town you know what do you recommend I love that because I am not perfect and I was guilty of that right I would always look at every opportunity like what can I get from this and when I especially even new and starting business I was like well if this isn't going to get me anything I don't want to do it so for my listeners out there I'm not just spewing things like this is something that I personally did. 
And I had to overcome and realize that it's not about what I can gain, but how I can help others. And so now I come from a place of give, give, give. How can I add value to somebody else? And I love that you bring that bring that up because there's so many ways to add value to someone. Um, for me, it's either providing a solution to one of their problems that they're that they're going through, or helping them walk through a particular mindset issue that they're that they have going on. But you can do this by you know reaching out to people on social media. You can get on podcasts. I love podcasts because they allow you to be able to have more of an intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation yeah. with somebody. So I absolutely love podcasts. I, I host a podcast myself, and that's one thing I love to be able to grab connections and hear from other people and learn from their mistakes and be able to help in any way possible. In fact, at the end of my podcast, the number one thing I say is, what can our audience do to support you? Because I'm in the place of give, give, give. And so I want to be able to help anybody I possibly can because that's how you build those long, meaningful connections. And when you have those connections and you're connected to a large audience, eventually, and it's not going to be right away, but eventually you're going to get something from that. And one way, shape or form, you will gain something from that. And you might not know what it is at the time. So make sure that you're just giving, giving, giving and never expecting anything in return, but it, it will circle back. It'll always come back to you. So Jacob, I've got to throw, um, you know, you're, you're sitting here with two Jersey guys right now. We're from, we both been in Atlanta now, more, you know, I guess half our life or so, 26 plus years, but you, and I, I would say South Jersey, more Philly for myself. So I'm going to have to take the Iowa guy meaning yourself. And I'm going to have to refine what you said, and I'm going to push you here a little bit with a question, if I may. So, Ted, I forgot about this. I used to speak about social capital forever. I haven't talked about social capital. And we talk about the bank account, right, Jacob? And I've always spoken about, you know, if I gave you, Jacob, a, a lead that netted you $100,000, for example, I'm not looking for that exact dollar amount. The way a social bank account works is not a dollar for dollar. It's a thought for a thought. So you give me a lead that lands me $10 or puts a smile on my face. You thought of me. I thought of you. There might be a monetary beneficial difference. It doesn't matter. That's the social capital game. But I do have to say as the Jerseyite or Philadelphian as myself, let me ask you a question. If you're giving and giving and giving, what I've done as I've gotten older with my social capital is I am all about giving. But there is a fine line when you're dealing with somebody who's a taker, and there has to be a line that you draw. Now, I joke about your Iowa, you know, wonderful Midwest, terrible Yankee sitting over here. So I'm a giver giver, but I have kept a social capital bank account, not based on dollars amount, Jake, not, not, not based on how much you gave me specifically or a lead, but have you thought of me? Have you sent me a note recently? Have you, you know, sent me a $5 Starbucks card to get a coffee is equivalent to me sending you a lead that puts 25 grand in your pocket. That's not an issue. What are your thoughts on, is there a line to be drawn for giving? Because I hear you, but I wanted to clarify that. I will say absolutely yes. Now I am a hundred percent guilty of always like having the giving mindset and I get, in, it gets me in trouble sometimes because sometimes you <laughs> give some of your time or, you know, whether it's financial, but it, it gets me in trouble sometimes. But so, but yes, there, there is a line that you need to cross and you almost need to recognize, is this person just almost taking from me, like just soaking up everything and they're not providing any value to my life. And so that's something I've actually, I've had to do that. And on actually on a a uh, plane ride back from Nashville after attending a, one of the events, I, I wrote down a list of everybody in my life that uh, doesn't provide value. And by value, I mean, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean a financial value, but provide value in any sort of way. And so I actually wrote down a list. And then out from that list, I said, okay, well, now what, which of these people just take from me? Like, well, I'm just constantly providing, 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 and I nothing comes back at full circle. Like nothing comes back in return. And I did have a small list of that. And it kind of was like, oh man, I've, I spent a lot of time here and I've spent a lot of finances here and giving this person a lead or helping out this person and it's gotten me nowhere. And so, yeah, I would say there, there is a fine line and I don't know if I can tell you exactly how you recognize that fine line, because I think it's up to the person. It's, it's up to that individual to figure out what that fine line is for them. Uh, again, for me, I'm guilty of it. I love, I love helping people. It's why all my businesses have been based off from helping people because that's the person I am. So it's really hard for me to find that, but there is, there's people out there that just take and they will drain you and they will drain you quickly. So you got to make sure to cut those off quickly. I love yeah. your answer, by the way. So there is a line, um, you draw your own line. I think it's a movable line. And I think it's oh, 100%. Line, like you said, but I love the fact that you still have a line and all about giving, but still just keep kind of a, a turned eye to make sure 
that you're getting something in return, even if it's just a thought. Would you agree? 100%. Uh, I was actually in Nashville just a couple of weeks ago and I was attending an event there called Rise and Record. And there is a speaker, James Whitaker. Um, he hosts the Win the Day podcast and he's always says, you're one connection away from your life changing. And that's why I believe in so much of connections. And we were talking about connections and building connections, but you also got to watch it, like you said, because there's people out there that just want to take from you. You know, I'm wondering, you know, we talked a lot in the podcast here about freeing up time and ways to get more time back. But when you build a business, we see that it's very hard for owners to determine when may be the time to exit. How how will you know or how do you know when's the right time to walk away from the business? Even, even sometimes when you love the business financially, it may make great sense. How do you how do you coach people on that? So that's a tricky one because everyone's reason is different, right? So for me, it was, I needed more time back. I, I knew that I, I still loved what I did. I didn't want to necessarily leave it. And, but I knew that it was going to be the second most important thing in my life. No longer the first, because now I had my baby girl. That's the first priority now. And so for everybody, it's different, but I would say that the first thing that I, I, I see a lot of times people need to really get out of their business is the burnout. Uh, we may get uh, clients that come on and they're just like, I'm just, I'm, I'm burnt out. And then it's like, well, what are you doing? Oh, I'm working this many hours, 70 hours, uh, 65 hours, and I can't do, do everything I need to do. And so then it becomes the coaching process of, well, now we got to look at why you're doing that. Are you, are you doing it because you feel like you have to, or are you doing it because you don't have systems in place, structures, documentations, um, all of that. Now, occasionally there'll be the business owner that comes to us with the idea of wanting to exit completely. They're ready to sell. And at that point it's looking, okay, well, let's look at everything you're doing in your business because a buyer, when they're looking at buying a business, they're not wanting to buy a business that's ran solely by the owner, or if that the owner isn't there, it's not going to run, right? That's the biggest thing that a buyer is going to look at. They're, they don't want to look at, hey, well, if you're leaving, who's going to do all this? It, it puts it on me. Like When I'm buying a business, it's, it's buying a, a time asset. I don't want to buy a time liability. And so uh, that's the... That, that's a whole different coaching structure because this person, they love their business. They've been working in it. It's, it's a completely different structure of how you go about getting them to understand, Hey, these are what you have to do to get your place or get your business to be able to be sellable and to get the most out of it. Yeah. This is why for a lot of the entrepreneurs that are watching the podcast today, it's just very interesting about Jacob's concept of purchasing time, but you're, you may also realizing that you may be purchasing value in the business as well from the perspective that a buyer is going to buy you on adjusted EBITDA. So whether you pay your salary or you don't, they're going to look at the real cash flows in the business. And if you hire a generation two person that's running it and you're not in it, even if you were in it, they're not going to pay you for all your cash flows. So, you know, it's a, a lot of owners don't understand that till they get to the finish line. And, you know, uh, they, they often treat their business like milking a cow. Uh, but, you know, uh, it, it's, it's really critical. But I was interested to hear your thoughts because a lot of owners don't know always the right time to exit because their head's down, driving sales, building culture, trying to retain employees. And and they may not know what's happening in the capital markets. And I know Lee the other day was talking to a friend of ours that owned a tent and event company. And, uh, you know, we, you never know when the opportunity comes around. That's why you, all, your tentacles always need to be up. Oh, 100%. And that's another issue is we we find, you know, as far as the financial statements and all that, they they just one day, well, I want to sell. And it's like, well, how when, when did this come to mind? Oh, just now, like last couple months. And then you go through the financials and you're looking at it and you're like, man, you have three years before you can sell to get the most amount of value out of this. We could sell if we needed to, but if you sell now, you're, you're, you're not going to get the most amount of uh, money you can for the business. And so that's a whole different, I mean, that's a whole different ballpark there too, but I see a lot of that as well. Listen, I feel like you're just wetting the whistle for a lot of people that are watching our podcast today. For those that are watching today, how can they find out about your podcast by time. Cause I feel like they could get a lot deeper into this conversation, listening to that conversation. What are you going to do in the car anyway, folks? You're, you don't want to listen to the radio. That's no good for you. You're going to learn good about that. And, you know, sometimes taking a, a break from those calls and listening to podcasts, you can get a college education, just listening to podcasts. So how do they find by time? Where can people find that? 
So we're on all the podcast stations. Uh, Spotify and Apple are the two biggest ones. Uh, you can search by time podcast, Jacob K. Mead, and I'll pop up there. I'm like chasing, a, I'm, I'm holding a clock really tight and gripping it because time's important to me. And I'm, <laughs> I have money trailing in the background with yeah, a vine trying comment. to pull me, pull Don't me forget back, the money. So. Don't forget the money. I love the picture. You got the clock in one hand. You got the money. And by the way, Ted, the money's fanned out. It's just not a wad like you get like at a bank. <laughs> it's fanned out, if I'm incorrect, Jacob. It's a hundred percent the 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 podcast picture. The money's fanned out, and I really wanted to symbolize that the vine is pulling me away, and that I'm willing to let go of some of the financial um, part of my life in order to regain my time. And so that's really what, what the that symbolizes in that in that photo is that time is the most important thing to me, which is why I'm clenching that clock so tight. And I know that you're not only an accomplished uh, author, but you're also a speaker as well. And you do coaching as well. So for folks that are are on the podcast today, how can they learn about that to get you in there and help them figure out how to scale top line revenue or become more effective with their time or run a better organization? Yeah, I mean, you can visit me on my website. It's jacobkmead.com or go on to my social medias. I'm at Jacob K. Mead on all the socials. I make it easy, all the same social line there. Um, so at Jacob K. Mead on all the socials or just go to my website, jacobkmead.com and let's connect and we can have a cup of coffee. Love it. This was a, a real pleasure today. Uh, I will tell you folks, when you talk to Jacob and Lee and I have done more than a thousand podcasts, okay? So give you perspective in here. This is probably the best single electronic kind of press kit that we we've seen in a long time so congratulations on that that's why this guy uh created sales a million dollars in a short period of time and he's growing as an entrepreneur every single day so jacob we appreciate you coming on the uh shrimp tank today and continued success to you thank you so much i really do appreciate it i've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank big fish small pond